All right, there's there's a uh, 2200 Zulu. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. How's everybody doing today? Excellent, thanks. Very good. Very very good to hear. Very good to hear. Uh, so welcome back. To, uh, this is the first session back at the Grand School. So we're gonna start off right here at week seven. Um, I'm glad to be back. We took a little bit of a recess there. I think the last school we did was probably in uh, November. Uh, towards the end, but uh, glad to be back. So, uh, you know, let's get right into it. Uh, and this week, we're going to be talking about aircraft performance. So, uh, it's already giving me issues. Okay, uh, cool. So, aircraft performance. So, today's lesson is going to talk about um, kind of all the things that encompass uh, the way an aircraft performs. So, we're going to talk about weight and balance. Uh, we're going to talk about how to compute weight and balance. We're going to talk about density altitude and how that relates to aircraft performance. Then we're going to, you know, do some things that are probably more applied. We're going to talk about um, looking at the graphs in the pilot's operating handbook and determining our takeoff and landing distance. And then we're also going to take a look at our cruise power setting tables in that pilot's operating handbook uh, and figure out what our, uh, you know, fuel burn should be. Um, and other things, uh, you know, what prop RPM is going to be at that power setting, and and so we'll we'll get into it uh, coming up here towards the end, but uh, should be an interesting lesson today. So first thing, my my uh, sorry, excuse me, my um, computer is just being a little wacky with the PowerPoint. I, I think you guys are going to see it correctly. Um, so first things first, aircraft in general uh, always get certified uh, with a maximum. Uh, gross weight or maximum takeoff weight. But one thing I want everyone to remember is that even though, you know, we could take off at that maximum takeoff weight, it's not always practical and it's not always safe. Um, and that could be, you know, a result of us being at a high altitude, a high temperature, a high humidity, uh, all these factors which could decrease the aircraft performance. Uh, and, you know, we might not be able to take off at certain runways if they're not long enough uh, because of the prevailing conditions where we're located. So why do we need to be concerned about weight? Well, the, the biggest reason would be overloading. Um, if we overload the airplane, right, we can increase the takeoff length, uh, which is, you know, the opposite of what we want. Uh, the rate and angle of climb can be reduced, so we're not going to get uh, a great climb out, right? Let's say we're somewhere in the mountains where it's hot uh, and we need to climb to avoid a bunch of obstacles. Well, if we're overloaded, we're definitely not going to be able to do that. Uh, the service ceiling, right, the maximum altitude that we can operate at is going to be lowered. We're going to reduce our cruising speed because the airplane has to have a higher um, pitch attitude in order to maintain altitude for the increased weight. We're going to reduce the range because the increased range, uh, the increased weight is going to uh, basically increase our fuel burn. Our maneuverability is going to be decreased because we're going to have to be um, very careful in terms of preventing uh, structural damage, right? If we overload the airplane, we're putting ourselves at risk for structural damage. Um, we're also going to need, on landing, we're going to need a lot more runway, longer landing roll. And uh, overloading is also going to impose excessive loads on the airframe, uh, which can, you know, like I just said, cause structural damage. We can potentially... Uh, come into some kind of problem where we need to declare an emergency if we're, you know, causing structural damage halfway uh, or, or halfway through the flight. Any questions so far? All right. So aircraft weight is typically separated into four categories. We have the empty weight of the airplane, uh, which includes the airframe, right? So the entirety of the airplane, all the metal, the prop, the engine, um, fixed equipment, right? So avionics and things are included in that. Uh, and then also any fuel that's like stuck in fuel lines uh, or in any oil that's, you know, residual and left in the engine, that would be included in the empty weight. However, that's basically fuel that we're not adding. That's unusable fuel, basically fuel that... Like a, it would be, you know, hard to purge from the system. Uh, we just include that. Uh, the useful load of the airplane is is another way we describe weight, and that useful load is uh, can include the pilot, passengers, baggage, and then any fuel and oil which we add. 
Uh, the takeoff weight, right? That's the empty weight plus the useful load. So we have the weight of the airplane and then plus whatever we're adding on top of that. And then we have landing weight, which is takeoff weight minus the fuel used. For our purposes and the airplanes that we're flying, most likely the landing weight and takeoff weight are going to be pretty much the same. Some larger aircraft have maximum landing weights, maximum takeoff weights, which can be different. So uh, continuing with this discussion, uh, we have to remember that an airplane is balanced in flight. Right. So if, if you think about it, an airplane is really balanced around a an invisible point and that invisible point is the center of gravity. So that center of gravity is where all of the weight is is um, is targeted or kind of balanced around. So if you were to hang the airplane from that point by a string, it would basically stay completely level. So in order to find our center of gravity, um, or, or rather, depending on when our center, where our center of gravity is, the airplane may fly differently. And we discussed the ways that it may fly differently a couple uh, lessons ago. That might have been in lesson or five or six. We discussed, you know, the adverse effects of having uh, the center of gravity in different positions. So um, let's talk about how we start to calculate our weight and balance, right? So. For our for every aircraft, there's a reference point that the manufacturer determines, and this reference point is referred to as the datum. So, for all intents and purposes, the datum is basically an imaginary line. So, if I pick out my pointer here, that imaginary line is right around here, and it's basically the point where you're going to measure from. And you might be thinking, well, what do I mean by measure? When we calculate weight and balance, we actually have to measure the distance uh, from the datum that we're putting objects or things that weigh anything, right? So if I put something in the back of the airplane, we're, we're going to have to measure where it is in the airplane uh, to sort of figure out where uh, where the weight's being distributed in order we, so we can find the CG position. So everything that we put in the airplane gets measured from this reference point. It can either be measured aft, which is going to be a positive number, or it can be measured uh, forward, which is going to be a negative number. And uh, the reference term that we use in distance, or, or the way we refer to that distance from the datum, is known as the arm. And the definition right here is that horizontal distance measured in inches from that datum point, which is uh, set by the manufacturer. Oh, come on. I don't know how, as the PowerPoint like freaking out for you guys. It's it's a little uh, it's like going in between two slides for me on my screen. I don't know if it's just a problem on my end. Looks good here. Okay, all right, good. That's a good thing. Uh, okay, so this is uh, now we're going to combine that weight and the arm we just talked about, uh, and that's going to get us to a term known as the moment. So uh, the moment is essentially the the combination of the arm and the weight. So it's essentially you take the weight of the object that you're putting in the airplane and you multiply it by the distance that you measured from the datum. And that's how you get your moment. So that formula used to find it is known as wham. I mean, it's called, uh, and that formula comes out to weight times the arm equals the, the moment. So most of the time, uh, we'll actually, to make things easier, we'll, um, reduce the moment by a factor of a hundred or a thousand because typically that number when you multiply the weight of an object times the arm it comes out to hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands so we'll basically make it into a ratio so that way when we add them together it's kind of easier to understand we're dealing with smaller numbers it's not actually smaller we're just reducing it for our purposes uh, to calculate things and that's known as the moment index so by combining all these concepts we can determine where our center of gravity is located and if the slide will stop freaking out for me, I can keep reading. So the center of gravity, the way we find that is we're also going to basically find our center of gravity in inches from the datum, either forward or aft. And the way we find that is we take the total moment that we've calculated and we divide that by the total weight of the airplane. And that will give us in inches where our center of gravity is. Now you might be thinking, why do we need to know our center of gravity? Well, if our center of gravity, again, is too forward or too far back, the airplane's going to fly um, differently. 
and we're going to look at our weight and balance chart given to us by the manufacturer, and the, and the center of gravity has to fall within a certain uh, set of parameters in order to be safe for flight. So let's go ahead and practice one of these problems, and I want you guys to do this with me, right? So we're not going to go too deep, and I'm going to explain it as we go with some slides. Um, but let, let's go ahead, and I'll give you like a, a question that would be um, posed to a pilot. So the question here is, what is the maximum amount of fuel that may be aboard uh, this airplane uh, if it's loaded as follows? So they're giving us the empty weight of the airplane, right? And then they're also giving us the useful load, but they're giving it to us in um, different sections of the airplane. So the combined weight of the pilot and front passenger is 340 pounds. The combined weight of the rear passengers is 310 pounds. And the baggage weighs 45 pounds. And then the oil, they're saying we have eight quarts on board, uh, and we're basically going to figure out uh, how much that weighs and what the effect on the moment is. So what I was talking about before is we reduce the moment by a factor of, you know, 1,000 or 100. Well, they're giving us the moment of the airplane while it's empty. And you see it's moment divided by 1,000. So the real moment is actually 51.5 times 1,000, so it's 51,500. But we're just reducing it to make it easier to calculate and figure out um, to, uh, figure out all the rest of our numbers that we need to figure out the weight and balance. So we'll keep loading here. So let's fill in the blanks that we had the best that we can. So we need to find the moment for each type of weight. And remember, that uh, moment is the weight times the arm. Well, we don't have the arm. So how are we going to figure out what the arm is? So first things first, I've assigned each section a color. So pilot for passenger red, rear passenger's blue, baggage green, and oil yellow. On the next slide, well, here's how we figure out everything. We're going to use this graph. And each POH will either have a graph like this, or it'll have a table. So in this instance, right, we're using the graph. So no arm is given to us except for the oil. So the graph is different from the table in that we're going to use basically the lines uh, to figure out the moment. We're not really going to be given directly an arm. This, These lines represent the arm uh, or the total moment for each weight. So the way we do that is for the front passengers, right, we go to the left side of the graph where it says load weight in pounds. So I know the front passengers are 340 pounds. We put a, a mark here. We go right until we hit the line for pilot and front passenger. And then we go directly down. So it looks like our total moment divided by 1,000, right, is, let's see, 11, 12, a little, a little over 12.5, it looks like. For the rear passengers, right, we go at 310 pounds. We go sideways. We follow the blue line until we get the rear passengers. It looks like we're somewhere, let's see, 21, 22, 22.5. 7, somewhere around there, in pound inches divided by 1,000. For our baggage, we go down to 45 pounds, or 47, I can't remember. Let's see, what was it? It was 45 pounds, uh, and then we follow the line to baggage, and then we go down to find the, the moment. Uh, and for our oil, it actually just gives it to us. So it says it's negative 0.2. So we go now to this part of the graph. Uh, so we've been given the moments, and if we were using a table, the arm would be listed. We would just multiply the weight by the arm to find the moment. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add all these up. Uh, and we're going to find out, you know, the maximum weight of the airplane is 2,300 pounds. So we have a max FCG of 109 inches. We're basically going to find whether our CG and moment fall within this graph. So we're going to take the total weight of the aircraft, which is 2,300 pounds, and then we're going to take up our useful, we're going to add up our useful load and the empty weight, and we get that to be 2,060 pounds. I just want to make sure everyone's following me so far. Is anybody confused so far? Or uh, are you guys following me? Okay. All right, I'll take that as everyone's all right. So we're going to take that uh, empty weight plus the useful load. We get 2,060 pounds. So now we're going to subtract that uh, from the total takeoff weight, the maximum takeoff weight, 
And that's 2,300 pounds minus 2,060 pounds, and we get 240 pounds. So another way to think of this is we have 240 pounds of useful load remaining until we hit that maximum takeoff weight. So we could use the entirety of that for fuel. So Avgas, which is probably what this airplane is going to burn, weighs 6 pounds per gallon. So all we need to do now is divide 240 divided by 6, and we find out that we can carry 40 gallons. Now, we can carry 40 gallons, but is that going to throw our seat, our center of gravity off? If, if you know, we're at max takeoff weight's fine, but we need to see if we're still within um, the center of gravity limits for the airplane. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to put our weight in. So we have 240 pounds of fuel. We're going to see that's about 40 gallons here. Uh, on the fuel line, and we're going to go directly down and find we have a moment of about 11.5 or 11,500. So we're going to essentially just continue the process. So we're going to check if the CG and our total weight are okay for that airplane. So we're going to add everything up. Uh, we're going to add up, or actually, yeah, so we're going to add up our total moment and our total weight. So that's going to be 2,300, and let's see what this add up, adds up to. So let's do this together. I'll pull out a calculator. If you guys want to as well, go ahead. So add 51.5 plus 12.5 plus 23 plus 4 minus 0 0.2 plus 11.5. We get 102.3. And if we look at our chart here, right, 2,300, we want to draw a line all the way across 2300 and then we want to draw a line up from 102.3 and x marks the spot we're right on our max takeoff weight and we're also within the center of gravity limit for that so this airplane would be able to take off you guys kind of understand the point of uh why we need to get weight and balance information good question what's the difference between the normal and the GT category. Sure. So these are um, certification categories. So in the utility category, you can do different kind of maneuvers. Uh, normal category is just certified to do uh, typical flight. So like an airliner would be certified in the normal category. A utility category, you could do stuff like spins uh, and things like that. It's just the way that the aircraft is certified. So this, this aircraft is certified for two different categories depending on how you load it. I also have a very quick question. Sure. So if I get this correctly, you add moment if it's after the is uh, is behind the datum, and you subtract if it's in front. Yep. Uh, all that stood in the manual anyway, yep. so we kind of cover that. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Great. So if it's in front, you subtract. If it's behind, you add. All right. So yeah, based off our calculations, we can take off with a maximum of, uh, that's supposed to be 40 gallons, not 40 pounds, uh, and still be in our CG envelope. So excuse that little typo. All right, well, let's move on here. So let's talk about density altitude. So uh, the charts that you'll see in the pilot's operating handbook show what can be expected of an, air, of an airplane under stipulated conditions, and that's typically at standard temperature and pressure. Thankfully, uh, those performance charts allow the pilot to predict how an airplane will perform in non-standard conditions. So density altitude is essentially pressure altitude adjusted for non-standard temperature. And that a pressure altitude is the altitude when the altimeter is set to 29.92 uh, inches of mercury, or if you're in other parts of the world, 1013 hectopascals. And those are the um, standard pressure settings uh, that we use in the aviation world. So there's a bunch of things that affect uh, density altitude. So temperature is one thing. The relative humidity, right? We talked about relative humidity during our weather unit. And that is uh, essentially the amount of water content in the air relative to the maximum that the air can hold for a certain temperature. Uh, but it's not considered when the charts are formulated. So Really, it's not as relevant as things like altitude and temperature. Um, but typically, we can assume that performance is decreased when humidity is high, altitude is high, and slash or temperature is high. And we refer to decreased performance sometimes as a result of, you know, being high altitude, 
the temperature being hot and your airplane could be relatively heavy. So you'll hear in aviation, you know, oh, it was high, hot, and I was heavy. And, you know, I had a hard time climbing out. So one good way that I like to tell people uh, of how to remember what density altitude is, instead of saying, you know, it's pressure altitude adjusted for non-standard temperature, because that's what it is on paper, um, think of it as the altitude at which the airplane feels like it's at. So if you were at sea level, but the density altitude was 3,000 feet, the airplane is going to feel like it's taking off at 3,000 feet and not sea level. It's basically the uh, the altitude at which the airplane performs at, in a sense, if, if you guys kind of understand that. And I want to make sure you guys understand that. If you don't, um, tell me, and uh, I'll try to think of another way to explain it. So basically, if you're at sea level, mm -hmm. you set your altimeter at 29 or 9 or 2. Right. And whatever altitude it's saying you're at, that is the density altitude. No, that is the pressure altitude. I'm sorry. Uh, but you can find the density altitude once you have that pressure altitude. That's why I bought it up. So you, you set it to 2992 to find the pressure altitude, and then you would calculate for non-standard temperature, what the density altitude is. Uh, and we're going to go over the formula here on the next slide. So we need to first find pressure altitude. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is just set your altimeter to 2992 and use the number it reads. So in this case, it says 6,500. So I believe that's what I used on the next page. So let's calculate it. Uh, the formula is density altitude equals the pressure altitude plus 120 times the outside air temperature minus the standard temperature for that altitude. This is just a, a, a quick formula. There are um, more accurate formulas, but in terms of actually finding density altitude, this is going to be close enough. So in our previous example, the pressure altitude was 6,500. So we'll use that, and we'll assume the temperature at 6,500 is 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so we also need to find the standard temperature at 6,500 feet. So does anybody here know what the standard temperature is at sea level? 15 Celsius. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So we talked about in our weather unit about lapse rate. And lapse rate is the rate at which temperature changes as you increase altitude. Does anybody remember what that is? Approximately two degrees Celsius per thousand. Yep. Yeah. Two degrees per thousand feet. That's exactly right. Um, so what we need to do is we need to find the standard temperature at 6,500 feet. So we can take two degrees Celsius away for every thousand feet above sea level. So the easiest way to do that is just do 6.5 times two degrees Celsius. So in theory, we should have lost 13 degrees Celsius over that 6,500 feet. Uh, and we know that it's 15 degrees at, at sea level. So we'll do 15 degrees minus 13 degrees. And we should it should be on a standard day 2 degrees at 6,500 feet. So now we're going to plug everything we have into the formula. So density altitude equals the pressure altitude, which is 6,500, plus 120 times, well, we'll do parentheses first, right, PEMDAS. So what's 20 minus 2? Right, 18. And then we're going to multiply 120 times 18. So that's uh, 2,160 feet, which actually that's 4K resolution. That's that's funny. Um, and then we're going to add that to our pressure altitude. So what if you guys are doing this with me, what altitude does that come out to? 8,660. Yep. So our, our density altitude is 8,660 feet. So the airplane's going to feel like it's at 8,660 feet, if that makes sense to anybody. If it doesn't, please you know, ask now. I'd like to cover it before we move on. All right. Wonderful. I'm glad you guys are getting this. Or if you're not and not telling me, shame on you. Let me know, please, if, if you don't get it. So now that we've covered density altitude, um, we're going to talk about takeoff performance. So this is a takeoff table for a uh, Cessna 172R model. So that's the 160 horsepower model. It's got a Lycoming IO360-L2A in it. 
uh, and it's got a max takeoff weight of, of I believe, 2,450 pounds. So we, when we're taking off, we need to know the ground rule, and typically we also need the total amount of distance over the ground to clear a 50-foot obstacle. So we're going to take our pressure altitude, and we don't. when we're looking at charts, we typically don't actually need the density altitude um, because they're accounting for that in the chart by showing changes in temperature. So the chart itself is already calculating density altitude. So what we need to do is we need to take the pressure altitude in feet uh, and then go over to the right uh, for whatever temperature we're near, and that's going to be our takeoff distance. So I'll give you a couple parameters, and we'll do a problem together to kind of work through it. So let's say we're going to use runway 1-3, uh, and we're going to be at 3,000 feet elevation, Right, let's say it's, uh, you know, the altimeter is 299 or 2 already, so the pressure is fine. Uh, the, and the winds are going to be 110 at 18, but it's going to be 20 degrees Celsius outside. So next we need to look at our notes. So over here on the bottom, we see that, you know, this is for a short field technique. Uh, you know, if we're at 3,000 feet, we should lean the mixture. But it also says here... Decrease distances by 10% for each 9 knots of headwind. For operation with tailwinds, increase distances by 10% for each 2 knots. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and work through that. So when it says headwind, it's talking about our headwind component. So it should be 18 knots if it was directly down the runway, but we need to see what percentage of our... Uh, of the wind is actually just headwind directly in front of us. So if it's 110 at 18, we're going to plug in accordingly. So this is a, head, a crosswind and headwind component graph, and this basically allows us to figure out what the headwind and crosswind components are. So what you do is you take the difference in angle basically between the runway and the wind. So we're taking 1-3 and the wind is from 110. So there's a, there's a 20 degree difference in wind. So we're going to go to the 20 degree mark here. We're going to take that down until we hit our wind speed of 18. Keep going, keep going. And we hit 18 right here at this red mark, right, right where these two lines meet. So if we go left or right, we can see what our headwind component is and what our crosswind component is. So it looks like we have a headwind component of about 17 knots and a crosswind component of about 6 knots. So now we know that you know we have a 17 knot headwind component and a 6 knot crosswind component. So we're going to go back to our chart. We have a 16 knot headwind component. And the chart at 3,000 feet and 20 degrees Celsius, it says we need 1,305 feet of ground roll and 2,360 feet uh, to clear that a 50 foot obstacle. But this is with zero wind. We're not accounting for wind yet. So if we follow the chart down here, we need the decrease takeoff distances by 10% for each nine knots. So if we use a proportion, right, I'm not going to go into math here, but uh, if we decrease for every nine knots, we have 16 knots. So we can decrease our total figure by 17.7%. If it was 18 knots, it would be 20%. But because we're somewhere in the middle, we're going to decrease by 17.7%. So that's going to leave us with 1,074 feet of ground roll, not 1,305, and 1,942 feet to clear a 50-foot obstacle. Does that explanation, does this problem kind of clear things up about this for you guys? Yeah. Okay, if it's not, again, guys, a go ahead and ask a question. What was that, Eric? A bit complicated. It is a bit complicated, you know, and it's it's going to take some practice to get the hang of it. But every chart for every airplane is pretty much the same. Some airplanes will actually use graphs, though. Um, I didn't think that that was necessary to go into. Uh, it's basically the same concept. You just have to draw a line for everything like we did with the weight and balance. And so these uh, totals in the charts, those are at maximum takeoff weight? Uh, yep, that they are at maximum takeoff weight. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, you know, obviously, if you can meet the distance at maximum takeoff weight, you're not going to have a problem at uh, less than maximum takeoff weight.
I only have one question. Sure. When you're talking about um, figuring out your crosswind component, your headwind component, mm -hmm. um, do you have to account for the, because you know how they, the runways are magnetic and the winds are true? Do you yep. have to do that conversion too or no? Um, or it's close it, enough? Well, here's the thing. If, if you're an airfield, yeah, I mean, you could, you could apply the variation principle. A lot of people don't. It's really not something that's done that often. Um, but for for yeah, for these calculations, it's really not necessary. Again, you could um, you could find that depending on you know the airport you're at. I I would say go ahead and add it. I I never do personally. But uh, you know, l let me find that actual answer for you. I'll do that right now. And I would think that it would be more critical on a, on a runway when you're basically coming up on those numbers and that's the length of the runway, huh? I mean, if you have like a 5,000 foot runway, who cares? Yeah. Um, huh? Yeah, so yeah, you actually do need to, um, or you're supposed to, in theory, add that magnetic variation. So if you were, you know, if we were using runway 13, um, you, sh you should really convert that for the variation. So you would add or subtract the variation. Okay. Don't most charts show the true of a runway? I'm sorry? What was that? Most charts, they show the true heading of the runway. Wouldn't you just substitute that number for the runway? Well, run runways are all based off magnetic heading. Oh, okay. So I, I, I see what you're saying. About that. That's my fault. I misspoke. Yeah, uh, James, in Sky, uh, Sky Vector, if you look at the F1 information, it actually shows the runway headings in true for some reason. Oh, okay, yeah. So if you have the runway heading in true, then uh, you could use that. But if it's not, if you're at the airport, uh, I would apply, uh, you know, if you're going west. Actually, if you're converting from magnetic to true, you're going to do the opposite. So if you're going west, you're going to subtract. If, you're, if it's easterly, you're going to add. Because you're going for the opposite direction with variation. All right, let's move on here. So let's talk about landing performance, right? This is it's going to be the exact same procedure, um, just the other way around. This is for landing. So to find the ground roll and landing distance, take the pressure altitude and plug it in. So let's assume those same conditions, right? So we'll say, uh, you know, the 16 knot headwind uh, or the 7 16 knot headwind and the 6 knot crosswind. Uh, and it's going to be slightly different with the notes, right? So the chart claims that we need 625 feet of ground roll and 1,415 feet to clear a 50-foot obstacle. But again, we can decrease that by 17.7%. That's going to leave us with 514 feet of ground roll and 1,165 feet to clear a 50-foot uh, obstacle. So very simple. It's the same process for landing as it, or for calculating landing as it is for taking off. Is there any questions about this? Why the fifty feet uh, obstacle is relevant in the landing? Um, you know, if there's trees on the edge of the runway and you need to clear over them, um, they'll give you that number. It's just something that's typically used in aviation. They'll give you the distances for a fifty foot obstacle. I, I've never actually found out the reason why. I think it has to do with that's the way that the in the U.S. the FAA tests you know short field landings and short field takeoffs. So it might just be a, you know, a U.S. cork for, you know, planes that are built in the U.S. Thanks. So, uh, again, we're going to, the, the, these tables work exactly the same as uh, the landing and takeoff distance tables. You're going to put in your pressure altitude, uh, and it's going to basically just tell you at, uh, at what RPM you're going to get certain power, certain crews, and certain fuel burn. So it, it's relatively similar, and I, I'm pretty sure you guys can figure this out. I don't think I labeled it. So let's say we're at 6,000 feet on a standard day. Uh, what speed and percent would we get at 2,200 RPM? So I want one of you guys to look at this chart and tell me, or multiple of you guys. Now, I won't tell you right away if you're right, but I'll take a couple answers. So 6,000 feet, uh, 2,200 RPM. What uh, cruise speed and power percentage would we get? I want you guys to take a look at this. And 
67 percent at 111 and 7.7 7 gallons okay all right anybody else got some ideas i want to hear hear from everybody no okay all right so yeah standard day standard temperature you guys are exactly right you'll get 67 percent of the maximum rated horsepower you're going to cruise at 1100 knots true and you're going to burn 7.7 .7 gallons per hour so let's let's swap that up a little bit let's test your guys knowledge let's say we're at 4,000 feet um let's say it's 20 degrees above standard um what power would we get at 2100 RPM? Fifty nine. Fifty nine. Yeah, exactly. So all you really have to do is just go to the right until you hit the number you want. So yeah, 59 right here is exactly correct. We'd cruise at 103 knots true and we'd burn 6.8 gallons per hour. If we're leaned properly, if we're at the lean mixture, which is peak EGT, um, this is the best economy cruise chart. There's also a best power cruise chart. So this would be leaned to lean of peak exhaust gas temperature. So uh, I think that's it. So yeah, very short lesson today. Only about a half, a little more than a half hour. So if you guys have any questions, uh, if you want me to go over anything, uh, I otherwise have a good uh, weekend, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. I'll see you next week. Are there uh, are these slides available um, as a download or PDF or something? Uh, they're on my Google account, but I I could probably send them to you. Uh, can you talk uh, something about uh, leaning the mixture? Uh, how do you calculate? How do you assume that? So you you don't actually have to calculate it. You, you'll actually do it in the airplane. So there's two quick ways of doing it. And I don't have an example set up, but I'll, I'll try to explain it to you as easily as I can. So when you're in flight, uh, when you're in cruise, if you start to slowly pull the mixture out, in, and not every airplane has an exhaust gas temperature probe, so I'll, I'll tell you how you would do it in like a, a 172. Um, what you can do, or, or even the 152 doesn't have an EGD probe. So if you're in like a Cessna 152, if you're in cruise, the way you should lean is you want to slowly and slowly pull the mixture out. And you'll notice as you do that, the RPM is actually going to start to increase. And eventually, you're gonna hit a point where the RPM peaks, and if you continue to lean, the RPM will start to dro drop. So in like a 152, you want to lean the mixture until you hit that peak RPM. So that would be leaning to a peak RPM. Now there's another way to lean in like a 172 where you have an exhaust gas temperature gauge. You want to keep leaning that mixture out slowly until the exhaust gas temperature peaks. So like the RPM, the exhaust gas temperature will peak at a very hot temperature. And as you continue to lean, it'll actually start to drop and you'll start to lose power. So you want to lean to peak EGT and then you want to either enrich in it 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit or lean it 50 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on if you want economy or um, best power. And if you want later, I can pull up the sim and kind of give you a, a, an actual demonstration. But there's also some good YouTube videos on that concept. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, how often do you lean it? Uh, about 1,000 feet or uh, quick? Or missing? I typically, uh, I, I won't I won't lean at all until I'm above 3,000 feet MSL. And then when you're getting higher, every, how, how many? Yeah, you just, keep, you just keep leaning to that peak EGT because eventually as you climb, you're going to need to re-lean. So you just, you'll just do, redo the procedure essentially. You'll redo that leaning procedure. But that that's a continuous process. You always change uh, the you, you can you can yeah you can do it every thousand feet. You know it's whatever you're comfortable with. I I in my plane, you know, when I hit three thousand feet, I lean a little bit, uh, and then when I you know climb another thousand feet, I'll lean a little bit more, and just make sure that uh, my EGT is peaking and then staying pretty much where I want it. That was that it that is was uh, what I wanted to hear. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I'm just wondering, uh, 
you know, I don't know much about this at all, but like uh, I've seen in uh, operating manuals, you say to lean the aircraft on the ground to prevent uh, spark plugs fouling. Uh, what were you doing in that procedure? Sure. Uh, so slightly different on the ground because the airplane's not producing a lot of thrust or power. Uh, so typically I'll just lean it slightly, uh, you know, they say, you know, just pull it out an inch or two inches. There's really no way to gauge it. It's kind of just lean it until it seems like the engine's running smoothly. You can definitely tell when the spark plugs are fouling. So I would say on the ground, you could lean it an inch out or an inch and a half out. Or if you really wanted to, what you can do uh, is another way it was taught to me on the ground is you can increase the power to like, you know, 20%. And then start leaning, and once the engine starts to stutter a little bit, then just stop there, and then increase it just slightly. All right, that makes sense. Thank you. I have a quick question. Sure. And this might be a little out there and probably more applicable applicable to real life versus sim flying. Um how much consideration is there to the actual weight of fuel based on temperature, specific gravity, and stuff like that? Uh, in terms, okay, uh, I can only comment on this because I worked at a fuel farm for aviation. Um, Same here. Yeah, for pilots, it's practically irrelevant. They always use the, whatever the standard weights are. Um, but in terms of a fuel farm, you know, we, we test our fuel daily and check our you know gravity and our volume depending on the temperature but for aviation in general for pilot it's it's irrelevant okay yeah that was one of the things i had to re record the specific gravity every day mm -hmm. and the actual weight of fuel so i didn't know if that made much of a difference in small general aviation versus you know commercial yeah i i i'm I'm pretty certain that even in commercial airliners, they just use the standard weight for jet fuel, which is 6.7 pounds per gallon. Okay. Uh, I just have another question. Sure. Um, this may also be more applicable to the real world, uh, perhaps not, but um, you showed us how you calculate all these parameters and uh, you take of distances according to these paper charts mm -hmm. that the manufacturer gives you. Uh, and I wonder, do you always do that in the, in the, in the real world uh, for like every flight or uh, do you use calculators or certain apps and that sure. such like how, how would you do that in the, like your example, for example? Right. Yeah. So in the real world, I actually use um, a multitude of things. So I use an app called ForeFlight. Uh, and I can do my weight and balance in seconds. I just I plug the data from the chart into the app, and then I can from now on once you know once I have that loaded in there, I can just change the weight of every little thing I want, and it says okay, well you're within takeoff, uh, and then I have another app that I use for takeoff and landing distances. Yeah, nice. Yeah, it's good to hear that you can use these tools and such. Uh, but of course, it's nice to. Yeah, it, it's it's obviously the, it's obviously critical yeah. to be able to do it by or or understand the concept before going to these calculators. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. All right. Thank you, James. Once again. No problem, and I'm glad you came this week, Edward. I have to show up once in a while. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you, James. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks.